Hi, everybody. Welcome to Legal Basics for Time Banks and Barter Exchanges. I'm Janelle Orsi from the Sustainable Economies Law Center, and this is a webinar that we're putting on. Basically, we're creating a video that we're asking people to watch, and then we're going to have a online chat that we're going to host next week where people can come and ask questions and discuss some of the things that they saw in this video. Um, if we decide to leave this video up online, one disclaimer that I want to give is that a lot of this information could become outdated, perhaps because the laws are going to change in the near future. But the goal right now is to describe the laws as they currently are so that people who are starting time banks and barter exchanges or people who are participating in them can understand the legal implications of what they're doing and understand the legal requirements. So in addition to this video, we are going to create a second video in a couple weeks that is focused on the legal issues applicable to the creation of complementary currencies. And truthfully, there's a lot of overlap between these two topics because when you create a barter network and you create a system of points or credits for exchange of goods and services, in many ways what you are creating is a currency. Um, so, but nevertheless, we're dividing them into two different webinars and um, it's probably a good idea to watch both, but this one is particularly uh, applicable to time banks and barter exchanges. Just to give a little bit of context, right now there are hundreds, if not thousands, of time banks and barter networks in the United States, and they're growing really fast. Some folks that we know at Time Banks USA have indicated that they're getting maybe one call per week from a group forming a time bank. So as this is growing, we recognize that there is a need to get the legal information out there to the time banks as efficiently as possible. A little more context, and I think probably I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, just why do we have time banks and barter exchanges? And one of the major reasons is that although we have U.S. dollars to exchange with in this country, and it's very nice to use dollars and it's nice when you have them, dollars can become very scarce. And, they're, and when they're scarce, they tend to be attracted to only certain kinds of things, and those types of things are you know, rent, mortgage payments, cheap food, cheap goods, any investment that will actually help the money to multiply and make more money. Like, these are the high priority areas for how people are spending their money. And there are a lot of things at the same time that contribute to a better life and a better world. And these are the things that our dollars are a little bit more hesitant to move toward because when there is a scarcity, we tend to reserve our dollars for those major things. And we don't tend to spend them on... Uh, you know, handmade items or preventative health care or art or just other things that create a better and more caring community. So you've probably at some point been counseled on what it means to be a wise investor and you've probably been told that if you're putting your money in the stock market, you should diversify your stock portfolio and have high risk stocks, low risk and mix it all together so that at some point or somehow it comes out balanced and you're not taking too much risk with your money. And I actually think that the same goes for the mechanisms that we use to exchange with one another. So in the same way that people say, oh, blah, 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 diversify your stock portfolio, I think we should diversify our currency portfolio. And that means that we're not just using dollars. We are also using um, complementary currencies. We're participating more in a gift economy, using barter networks. And each of these things has a really different place, and I think that they tend to result in exchange of different types of goods and services, and they can create community at different levels. Um, so I think that they're very important. Uh, I think that everybody knows instinctively what barter means. When I started practicing law and I would tell people that one of the things I do as a lawyer is guide people on how to barter, people would roll their eyes about that, and they would always say something like, oh, you you can't meet your needs with barter in this society. Um, and I know that one of the reasons people roll their eyes about that is because barter can be inconvenient at times. I barter a lot, but there are definitely, a t there are definitely times where people offer me things that I don't need. These are things of value. They're just not of value to me. Um, I found a perfect example at a store or a print shop in Berkeley. It was just a posting on a wall. 
of a guy who wanted a wheatgrass juicer, and in exchange he was offering a DVD player or books and CDs to trade, which is so specific. I mean, how many people out there with a wheatgrass juicer are just sitting there waiting to get a new DVD player? So I thought it was funny, and I've always wanted to use this photo, and that's why I've included it. Um, but this is just a case in point about one of the reasons that barter networks and time banks have come about is because when you begin to exchange things in a network, you're able to get the value to the people who want it. And overall, it becomes a more efficient system and it creates more flow. So in these systems, basically, there's a system of points or credits or time dollars that in some sense of the word is a proxy for the goods and services that people are ultimately trying to give and receive. Um, this is a slide of the website of the International Reciprocal Trade Association. It is a big um, professional organization or industry organization of barter networks and it's a good source of information about barter networks. And so barter networks or barter exchanges are basically systems through which members of the network can provide goods and services to others in the network they receive points or trade dollars, and then they can spend those points and trade dollars to receive other goods and services from other people. Um, one thing that differentiates barter networks from time banks is, as a general rule, people participating in barter networks generally bargaining to get the market value of their goods and services. They're, they're bargaining and trying to maximize or optimize the value that they're getting uh, through their participation in the network. And that is, for the most part, different than time banks. The way that they operate is somewhat similar. Uh, they're both networks and uh, people are earning points or credits. Time banks generally have some sort of mission to make the world a better place, to build community, to provide for people in, in need. So that is one thing that generally sets them apart. And actually, I'll just describe a little bit more later about what differentiates time banks from barter exchanges. But at the very core, for the most part, people are exchanging services. And when one person provides an hour of service to another, they get a time dollar credited to them. And then they can spend that time dollar for an hour of services from somebody else. And it's measured hour for hour, meaning that people aren't necessarily trying to maximize the value of the services and goods or services that they're providing, um, even if in a regular market they could get a lot of money from, for their services, they're only receiving one time dollar for one hour. So it takes it out of the market context, which is important, and, it, and it's important for legal reasons that I'll talk about. I just put this slide on here. The organization Center for a New American Dream recently did a webinar on how to start a time bank. Um, and um, Oh, also this other slide that I had up, Time Banks USA, is a really great resource for, for people wanting to start Time Banks. So some questions that I'll address in this webinar are just general legal issues that come up when you are engaging in barter or participating in these exchanges. What are the tax reporting requirements for the actual exchanges, for, sorry, for the organizations that are facilitating the exchanges? So the organization that administers a Time Bank, for example, uh, what are the tax implications for the individuals who participate in these? And these are two different questions, um, which is really important, and I'll talk about that. And then how do you actually go about reporting the taxable income? And under what circumstance can time banks allow for the exchange of goods? This has been a question that's been circulating in the time bank world quite a bit. So I'll share some thoughts on that, even though the answer is not 100% clear. I'll share some thoughts on how we might advocate for laws that support the growth of barter exchanges and time banks, that recognize the important role that they play in society and basically remove barriers or create support for their development. And another question I'll look at is, what should be the legal structure of time banks and barter exchanges, and uh, for those that want to get tax exemption, how do they get tax exemption under 501c3 or 501c4? So first of all, in the bigger picture, it's important to say that 
a lot of the regulations that apply when people are engaging in exchanges with dollars will also apply when people are engaging in exchanges through other means, other means that don't use dollars. And I put this picture up here because regulations and regulators are a little bit like birds or birds of prey. Like sometimes they don't notice something unless it moves. And in the case of regulators, it's particularly particularly true of dollars. So there's almost an assumption that if a dollar moves, that that the, there's some sort of regulation that's going to kick in. If one person provides a dollar to another person, there's there tends to be an assumption that there's a commercial exchange. And when there's commercial exchanges, we have laws that help the government to collect taxes. We have laws to help protect people from each other in these exchanges, so to protect them as consumers or to protect them as workers. And so the interesting thing is, as the new economy and the informal economy, I think they are growing right now, there is a lot of flow of value happening in communities, and it's happening without dollars. And a lot of this is flying under the radar of regulators, partially because regulators don't care, but also because, again, they don't tend to see things if, if dollars don't move. But increasingly, regulators and tax authorities are recognizing this type of activity, especially as the activity is happening online and it's a little more easy to document. And also, uh, as it becomes more formalized in organizations, they're definitely perking up and saying, yes, we do want to regulate that or we do want to tax that. And actually, this happened as early as the 1980s when there was a growing number of barter exchanges. We saw a new law that indicated more clearly that not only is barter income taxable, which has kind of been the case for a long time, but also that the organizations facilitating barter need to uh, help in reporting uh, the transactions so that the IRS can collect taxes. So I'll talk about that. But in any case, um, I'm going to help try to well give guidance on how to navigate the gray areas between what is regulated and what is not. And I'm going to talk a lot about tax because a lot of this has been determined in the realm of tax law and there are rulings and letters from the IRS that help to navigate this issue much more so than there are rulings in other areas of law like zoning and and uh, commercial regulations and so on. But a lot of a lot of the same assumptions apply. So if you engage in an activity that results in taxable income to you, there's also a good chance that maybe a health and saf safety regulator uh, would consider you to be engaging in some sort of business that they also would like to regulate. I'm going to emphasize over and over again that there are, for time banks and barter exchanges, there are two really different questions. And the IRS has answered this first one somewhat clearly, which is the question of, when do barter exchanges and time banks have to do tax reporting on the exchanges taking place within their network? And that's actually a different question than the tax implications for each individual and each, each transaction. And one of the rulings that the IRS has put out on this has even ended with this quote, no opinion is expressed concerning whether a member earns income as a result of the member's participation in the program. So they basically ruled in that particular case the time, that the time bank doesn't need to give people 1099Bs for their transactions. But even if the time bank doesn't have to give them those, it doesn't necessarily mean that people don't owe taxes on that. And so this is a difficult situation because it means every individual for every transaction potentially needs to qu question is this a taxable transaction? And the next thing I'm going to do is give some guidance on how to determine that. And so I'll start with a question of what is income? Well, first of all, income is the thing that, as a general rule, is subject to tax. The IRS has definitely said specifically that barter results in income and is therefore taxable. And the IRS also says, or our tax regulations say, that gifts are not counted as part of income and therefore they are not taxed. And there are some exceptions to all of these rules, but these are the general rules. So it brings up the question of what is a gift? And you're going to see that there are incredible gray areas here. And there are gray areas that really force us to delve into the 
human relationships and the intentions and the feelings behind the exchanges that we make, which is, it's messy. And um, it's also a little awkward to note that it's our court systems and tax regulators who are helping us to figure this out. But there is a one, one Supreme Court case that helped to delineate a little more clearly what is a gift and what is not. One part of it is that basically gifts arise from generosity. Generally, they take place um, within the context of relationships out of respect or affection. Gifts don't come from some sort of moral or legal obligation. So if you feel obligated to give somebody something for whatever reason, it looks less like a gift. Uh, they're not given with anticipation of return. So if you give somebody a gift, but you're pretty seriously hoping that they're going to give you something in return, uh, more likely it's not going to be considered a gift for tax purposes. And gifts are not given as um, payment for another favor or in return for something else you've received. And, and, the, and the ruling also says the intention of the giver is what matters, which is hard because when you are the receiver, you're the one who's questioning, uh, is this taxable income to me? And to know the intention of the giver is a little difficult, in fact, because you're not inside their head. Um, and maybe even the giver doesn't know what their intention is. But in any case, this is the guidance we have to work with. So it's good to be familiar with that. And there are other tax publications and rulings that have given us a, a few more clues. So the IRS has definitely hinted that casual and non-commercial exchanges are not meant to be taxed for the most part. And later on, I'll talk more about how the rulings have delineated these things for the purpose of time banks. Uh, it specifically says an informal exchange of similar services on a non-commercial basi basis is not a barter exchange. And it's therefore not required to submit the same reports that a barter exchange is. And you can kind of extrapolate from there and say, well, in general, this means that the IRS is not too concerned with these activities. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not taxable, but basically it's the IRS's way of saying that this is the realm of life where people are giving to each other, um, just sort of in their personal domestic realms. And, and we know that tax regulators don't want to go there. I mean, they really can't measure what's happening in this realm. And they give this example of a carpool where people are exchanging. They're basically taking turns driving each other. And the IRS says, yeah, this does not result in taxable income. It's similar services provided on a non-commercial basis. Um, anyway, so that helps to give us some clues. And other rulings have said that sort of on the spectrum of exchanges, the IRS is less concerned when people are exchanging with each other or providing for each other in ways that don't give them contractual rights to receive things in exchange. And they're not bargaining for things at market rate, meaning they're not trying to get the maximum amount of value for what they're giving. And so the example they were looking at there is time banks and saying, well, if it's hour for hour, people aren't really trying to maximize their uh, value at a market rate here. So there's definitely a recognition that that exchanges are taking place with a very different frame of mind. And this is a kind of a funny phrase that I found in a letter. This is a letter from an IRS staff person to um, an entity that was creating a time bank for elder care. This is from uh, the mid-1980s. Edgar Kahn from, the, from Time Banks USA sent me this letter and I was I was just kind of amused at this phrase, which says that, which sort of said that this time bank, or more or less, is not so much a barter club because um, it's not really a for-profit motivation situation. So I thought, well, that's kind of a good phrase that we can just ask ourselves regularly. It's a little bit of a smell test that you could apply to things. Is this, does this feel like a for-profit motivation situation or is it more of a relationship building and giving and caring situation? Of course, there are gray areas, but in any case, I thought I'd highlight that phrase. So just to give you a visual image of the kinds of gray areas there are, there are definitely ends of the spectrum that 
are not really intended to be regulated or taxed. This is an example of an exchange of two sandwiches among friends. This is definitely an area that the regulators are leaving alone. This is definitely, this other realm in the yellow circle is definitely something that the regulators do want to pay attention to. And uh, the IRS is specific that this would be a taxable transaction between the lawyer and the sprocket salesperson. But of course you can imagine all kinds of things happen in between. I'm a lawyer and I have provided people with a lot of uh, legal services for free. My intention is, is sincerely to give to them, but every now and then they'll give me usually something to eat in exchange. They'll give me a cup of tea. Um, but you know, what if one of my clients were to give me um, four or 40 sandwiches in exchange? It's almost like they are making an attempt to quote unquote pay me for my services even if I didn't want those sandwiches. You know, depending on how you interpret the laws and the way that I interpret them, it's quite possible that this would be taxable because again it it goes back to that question of what is a gift? In the mind of the giver, they are paying for something. And um, of course I'll address later how do I determine the value of these um, 40 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But um, anyway, I've drawn the spectrum out here. I'm going to examine a few points on this spectrum specifically, not so much related to tax, but related to other laws like health and safety laws and zoning. I'm going to use the example of soup um, because Generally, just because money doesn't change hands, it doesn't mean that, say, the health and safety regulators aren't going to be concerned about soup changing hands. So on the far end of the spectrum, people are um, giving soup. They're giving soup to usually people they're in a relationship with, like they're having a dinner party or something like that. And that is a realm that the regulators pretty much don't care about. Next on that spectrum, however, is donating soup. And a lot of times when people donate something, it is not in the context of a relationship they have. It's more with a charitable intention. Often it's for people who, who are in need that they actually don't know or don't have a relationship with. So it's interesting to note that while health and safety regulators will not show up uh, at your household dinner party, if you take part in Food Not Bombs and you are um, going out into a public space and giving away soup, uh, the health department might show up and prevent you from giving away soup to strangers. So um, this is not a legal distinction that you'll find in any regulations. It's just the way that I think about it in my mind that that there is a little bit of a difference or, or that, yeah, there's a difference between donating and giving in, in the sense that there's different relationships involved. And so when there are different relationships involved, just be aware that different regulations might apply. Uh, further down the spectrum, we have um, another distinction that is, you know, this is a distinction that I draw in my head uh, between swapping and bartering. And so when you're bartering, you are potentially trying to get in return the value of what you have provided. So if I provide a pot of soup to somebody, perhaps my goal is to get something that's roughly the value of a pot of soup or more valuable to me. So swapping is maybe a little bit less calculated. And it's important because if I'm growing vegetables in my backyard and I have too many tomatoes and my neighbor has too many eggplants, and we swap them, we're probably not going to be measuring, you know, what's the value of these tomatoes, what's the value of the eggplant. And because of, you know, there's less desire to measure the value, there's less desire to maximize our value, there's more desire to give, there's more of a relationship. I call that swapping, and I try to differentiate that. And one reason is, is that in the city of Oakland, uh, there was an urban farmer who was kind of swapping and or bartering with uh, other people in the neighborhood. Um, and the city said, oh, you can't barter in this, in this residential area. This was a zoning issue. It was a residential neighborhood. 
so no commercial activities would have been allowed to take place, and they said, therefore, you can't barter with your vegetables. But uh, this is a case where I would stand up and say, you know, barter is different than swapping, casual swapping. People should be able to get together with their neighbors and, and just share what they have. So, um, oh, lastly, on the end of the spectrum, sometimes simply giving something away will trigger regulations because you're giving it away with a commercial purpose. So if you're giving away soup, for example, you're giving away free samples with the ultimate goal that people are going to come and buy the soup from you. Uh, usually if you're doing that in public, the health department's going to want you to get a permit first. So I just bring this up just to demonstrate that people give with so many motivations and those motivations and the relationships involved do actually determine when regulators are going to show up and pay attention. So um, I'm going to delve a little more deeply into this soup example just because um, because especially in the tax realm there can be a lot of gray areas but just you know imagining that I have a dinner party or in fact I went to a friend's house for dinner last night and I brought most of the food and I did in fact bring soup in exchange my friend hosted meaning I didn't have to clean my house and they did the dishes afterwards which to me is worth everything in the world um, this is really a gift economy. This is not a situation where just because I brought the soup, I am now going to have to pay taxable income on the value of them laboring to do the dishes. So that's what I'll call gift economy soup. And But, you know, you can change this in small ways, as I'm about to say, uh, that does move it into the realm of taxable income and uh, or regulated activity. And so if I'm moving along the spectrum a little bit further, and let's say, um, let's say that I throw soup parties all the time. People are always coming over. And generally, I offer this to my friends. But what if I have an accountant and I say, hey, accountant, if you provide five hours of accounting services to me, I'll invite you to five of my wonderful soup parties. And here we have uh, an exchange that is bargained for, and we're basically creating a verbal contract. So... I would say that this is barter, and suddenly now the soup party, at least with regard to um, the accountant, has moved into the realm of a taxable barter um, transaction. If I start to get a little bit more uh, serious about my soup making and get out there in the community, maybe I'll join a time bank and start uh, providing soup to people who are in need and then accumulating time dollars for the time I spent making the soup for them. Uh, and I later, um, later yeah, I accumulate the credits and then I, I can later spend them for other things that I need. Uh, Generally speaking, and it depends on the time bank uh, and how it works, as I'll mention later, the IRS has kind of given vague indication that they're not interested in taxing um, or at least tracking or having the time exchange, time bank report these transactions. Uh, again, it'll be up to me to look at the specifics to determine, okay, is this more like a gift or is it more like uh, a commercial transaction? And then it's up to me to determine whether I should pay taxes on it. Um, soup for hire. This could be an example where, let's say I live, uh, I rent a room or I rent a backyard cottage from somebody and they give me free rent if I, in exchange, cook soup for the family or maybe something other than soup from time to time, if I cook for them, basically. This is definitely um, taxable. I would be paying tax on the value, the market value of the rental unit that I'm living in, and my landlords would be reporting rental income, rental income meaning Schedule E income, on the value of the food that they're receiving. Um, but you know, you can actually imagine that this uh, landlord soup relationship could be a little bit more informal meaning that um, somebody can say, oh, yeah, you can live with me, oh, and it would be great if you cook sometimes. But if they're doing that more because, okay, this person needs a place to live right now, we have space, we'll let you live here for free, and it would be great if you just be a contributing member of the household like any person would, uh, then that moves it 
out of the realm of taxation, I would say. It's just people living together and eating and cooking together as a household. And uh, you could, of course, see that there's a gray area there. And it, again, depends on the relationship and the intent and the way that it's bargained for. Um, getting a little bit more serious about my soup, if I were to start soup enterprises and I start making multiple s pots of soup every day and I invite people over to share it and I put it into jars that people can pick up on my doorstep, um, nobody will ever pay me U.S. dollars for the soup, but I could basically use each jar of soup to pay for other things. I could pay for bike repair or fresh produce or health care uh, by actually giving people jars of soup and using soup instead of dollars. Uh, so that's definitely making me look like I'm operating a soup business, and for those purposes, of course, the health department is concerned, and uh, you know, the IRS would want to collect taxes on the value of what I'm receiving in return. Um, moving into the realm of currency just a little bit, just to make um, things a little more convenient than handing people giant jars of soup. Instead of giving them giant jars of soup all at once, I can give them certificates that they can later come and redeem for jars of soup at their convenience. And in many ways, basically, I'm creating a currency that is backed by soup. And I can put those into circulation in the community, and people might come and exchange them for the soup, but they also might exchange them with each other because each certificate has value that... Um, that might flow from one person to another. Uh, but at some point, the soup bucks are basically going to be considered to have a market value. And that market value would be measured in dollars for tax purposes. And when people are receiving soup bucks, let's say each soup buck is worth um, $10, then, um, then that's the amount of tax that people are going to need to, um, or that's the amount of income people are going to be needing to pay tax on. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, paying tax on barter. First thing you need to know is don't send soup to the IRS. At this point in history, the only way to pay taxes really is to pay dollars. And that's actually frustrating. Uh, it, you know, it sounds obvious, of course, this is the way things are, but it doesn't actually have to be that way. And one example of the way the government could begin to accept taxes uh, in other forms is to have people provide services. So setting up some sort of um, time bank through which people can volunteer or you know, having people volunteer for charities or governmental organizations could be a way that people could pay taxes because it's frustrating to have to pay taxes in dollars when you didn't actually receive dollars for what you're paying taxes on. So, Okay, another thing to know is that you need to determine the fair market value of what you're receiving. There's generally a presumption that people are exchanging things of equal value. So if I, if I generally say that, oh, my legal services are worth $200 an hour, um, people might assume that um, I am receiving $200 worth of sandwiches in exchange if I provide one hour of legal services. But you can overcome that presumption. And the way to do it is to maintain evidence of the value of what you've received. So in this case, if I really wanted to be diligent and careful, I would take a photo of the sandwiches or document in writing, maybe via email, what it is the person has provided to me. So uh, if, if I ever do have a tax audit, I can tell somebody, yes, I, maybe I provided 10 hours of legal services to this person, uh, but the sandwiches they gave me are not worth $2,000. And here's why I think that is because they only gave me 40 sandwiches and they were only peanut butter and jelly. And Still, I need to come up with some sort of value for the sandwiches. That's definitely not going to be easy. But you, to do this, you just basically look around. And you see what are other people in the world paying for their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, okay, third thing about taxes. Uh, you want to uh, report them. Actually, write the dollar value of what you receive on your income tax returns. If it's barter income that you kind of receive through a sporadic activity or a hobby, you'll probably report it as other income. Um, if it is in connection with a business, you're going to report it on Schedule C. 
and if it's in connection uh, or it's something you're receiving in exchange for giving somebody free or reduced cost rent, then you're going to report that as rental income on Schedule E. So here's uh, a 1040 form. Uh, this might be a little outdated since we made this, but um, but basically line 12 there is where you would point where you would uh, put the income from your business. And it's also important to note that if you're bartering in connection with your business and what you're receiving is would constitute a business expense. So if I'm providing legal services and in exchange I'm getting accounting services for my business, then the the value of the goods or services that I'm paying uh, in exchange for that uh, is deductible as a business expense. Okay, so I mentioned that the question of whether there's taxable income to an individual is different from whether the time bank or the barter exchange actually needs to do any reporting. So to the question of what are the reporting requirements, um, the rule is that barter exchanges and barter networks have to report the transactions that are taking place on their platforms or in their networks. And... Um, this comes out of the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982, TEFRA, and the rules haven't really changed very much since then, but basically the rules are that a barter exchange needs to report each transaction, this is what the law says, but I'll clarify that in a minute, uh, needs to report each transaction on a 1099-B form, except if the member taking part in the barter exchange is a corporate member, quote unquote, which is generally defined as an actual corporation, then in that case, you can report the transactions on an aggregate basis, meaning that at the end of the year, you give them one 1099 that reports the value of all of the exchanges that they engaged in. So it's a little less burdensome than producing a 1099-B for every single transaction. Uh, if you create a barter exchange that facilitates no more than 100 exchanges in a year, then you don't need to do this. And also, if there's an exchange that's valued at less than a dollar, you also don't need to do this. So um, I'll explain in a little bit but that time banks have generally been recognized as exempt from these reporting requirements if the time bank um, is meeting the requirements that the IRS has described. Uh, here is a 1099-B form. This is what it looks like. As you can see in box 1A, you need to actually describe what it is that somebody uh, received. Uh, so the IRTA, the organization that I mentioned earlier, that's a big organization of barter exchanges, provides a lot of support to barter exchanges and guidance. And this is something that I would not have known simply by reading the law, but apparently in practice the IRS has been willing to accept an electronic ledger that basically itemizes the transactions uh, for individuals and sole proprietors even if they're not incorporated. And so even though the regulations say that you can only do aggregate reporting for a corporation, um, in practice, apparently the IRS is allowing barter exchanges to do aggregate reporting for individuals. Um, one thing to note is most of the barter exchanges that um, that IRTA is working with are helping people exchange on a business-to-business -business level. So um, individual consumers exchanging with businesses, uh, it's less clear to me what the reporting requirements would be there. And as IRTA has pointed out, if you just build the 1099 and accounting function into the software that's administering the, the um, barter exchange, then this really doesn't have to be so burdensome. So, um, And there's a lot of software out there that has already built this type of function in. So the barter exchanges that I know that are using this type of software really aren't bothered by the 1099B requirement. It's the more grassroots level barter exchanges that the Sustainable Economies Law Center has advised, they're a lot more stressed about it because they don't necessarily have the money to hire a software developer to, or to use the existing software out there. Uh, it's important to make a little side note about sales tax. If you're selling something for um, exchanging goods through a barter exchange as opposed to services, um, let's say you're providing sprockets and receiving points for those, you're basically selling something and sales tax would therefore be due at the state level if, if you live in a state with sales tax. So 
And you have to pay sales tax in dollars, and it's your responsibility to collect it and pay it. And <clears throat> I'm actually less familiar in this realm about how barter exchanges have been uh, administering this requirement, but um, I just thought it would be important to mention that that is required. So with regard to time banks, the IRS has said in private letter rulings that time banks meeting certain requirements are not barter exchanges and they're therefore not required to do the same reporting. One thing to note about a private letter ruling is that it is a ruling that applies only to the case that the IRS is responding to. Uh, it, it's not applicable as law. You can't cite it as precedent. But it's helpful because what a private letter ruling tells you is more or less how the IRS is tending to think about a subject. And so if, if your time bank were to be questioned, uh, it's helpful to look at the private letter rulings to, to see what is the potential outcome. But I, one of the reasons why the IRS puts out private letter rulings is they definitely want to reserve the right to change their minds about things. So keep in mind that that's um, possible. But so in one private letter ruling, the IRS looked at a time bank and said, okay, the people who are exchanging here have no contractual right to receive things in exchange for the favors they do for others. And they're not bargaining for what they receive at a market rate. It's hour for hour, regardless of the value in a market. So uh, those are two really key factors that take it out of the commercial end of the spectrum, put it much more in the community and gift economy end of the spectrum. And it does not mean that there's no taxable income uh, being generated for the participants. And in fact, for some participants, depending on the nature of how they're using the time bank and the things that they're providing and receiving, it is quite possible that they should be paying taxes on the value of what they're receiving, and it's really up to them to decide. The important thing here is that the IRS is saying that the time bank doesn't need to report this, doesn't need to give you an informational return. And also, when, when looking at time banks and distinguishing them from barter exchanges, the IRS has also put some weight on the fact that the time banks are run by nonprofit organizations or charitable organizations. So gen generally speaking, if you want to avoid being considered a barter exchange, it's also a really good idea to form your time bank as a nonprofit. It's one of these private letter rulings gave a little more guidance about what is considered to be non-commercial. Uh, in addition to some of the other things I mentioned, uh, one of the factors is that members cannot um, cannot assign the points that they earn so it doesn't become something of value that you can then exchange in a marketplace but you can give them to family and household members. Uh, another one was that the Time Bank is a community organization and it consists primarily of people living in a specific area and you know this is again it's not a requirement this is not a rule that it has to be this way but it is a factor that was weighed in determining whether something was commercial and it could be pretty important because what it indicates is if people all live in a in the same geographic area, uh, quite potentially they have relationships with each other or they're going to have ongoing interactions that create a greater level of, of um, well, accountability and also um, tendencies to be generous to one another when, um, when there's more likely to be a relationship. Um, the, another factor was that the exchange does not charge a fee for participation. Again, this is not a rule that an exchange has to follow. And in fact, time banks, I think, are all struggling to figure out how are they going to obtain the income they need to actually operate and maintain the software and, and so on. Uh, and charging a fee might be one way to, to do that. But again, this is just a factor that is weighed. Uh, the other factor was just that the IRS pointed out that there were significant disparities in how the members um, were, or what the members were receiving through the time banks. A lot of them were maybe participating with a greater motivation to give and to serve the community, and in that respect, they were earning a lot of points but not spending a lot of points. Uh, and that just shows that this is not a system where everybody's trying to maximize their gain. Um, it is a system where people are helping to meet their needs, but they're also um, coming together as a community to work together toward that. That same ruling also gave some information about what does it mean, what is the definition of informal, and uh, one of the things is that it's up to the members to determine uh, whether services are um, going to be performed and where and when and how. 
uh, it's their responsibility to um, report the credits, and either member could report the credits. So if the person who receives some services forgets to tell the time bank, hey, this person did something for me, give them a time dollar, uh, the other person could. So it's, it's a system that's built on trust. It's a system without rules about how people exchange. Uh, it's basically a system that brings people together so that they, in the context of their relationships, can sort out the details of it. And um, again, these are not rules. But it's kind of like um, the time bank, in some ways, is a, it's like a reputation system that is uh, basically giving somebody a reputation for being a good community member. And it's not a platform that is providing services in a particular way and for particular amounts. It, again, takes it out of that realm of, of service, of uh, commercial service provision and more into the realm of, I guess, community service provision. And it's just that smell test again. It's like, is it a for-profit motiva motivation situation? And basically all those factors I just described lend to answering that question of whether it's a for-profit motivation situation. Another question you can just ask yourself is, what is really motivating people to participate in the time bank? Are people joining a time bank just because they think they can get a lot of stuff and they can get a lot of help? Or are they joining a time bank because they also really want to contribute to the creation of a vibrant community? And um, again, it's just another smell test. But um, it's an important question to ask along the way to kind of keep a time bank in that realm of, of gift economy uh, and not have it devolve or evolve into something where it's a lot more like a market. Okay, so the big question that a lot of people always ask is, can you exchange goods in a time bank? So the big question that people are always asking is, can you exchange goods through a time bank without causing the time bank to become subject to the reporting rules of a barter exchange? Because that's something the time bank is probably wanting to avoid. And it's not totally clear. The IRS hasn't been totally clear about how or if you can exchange goods. And of course, the reason is it's a little bit harder to, um, to um, I guess, measure uh, the goods in a way that create or that keeps them separate from the market um, context. So whereas with services, the easy way to do it is to just value everybody's hour the same. It's a little harder to do that with goods. Uh, another private letter ruling was issued, and um, again, it's a private letter ruling. It applies only to the particular time bank to whom it was issued, and I believe this is a time bank in Maine. And the ruling, it's kind of funny. It says, it acknowledges multiple times that this time bank is allowing people to exchange goods. Uh, it specifically says that some people are offering tangible items like tickets or discount from menu items at certain restaurants. But it doesn't exactly say how you're supposed to do that because then when it goes on to say how the value of things is measured, it keeps saying it's one hour for one hour. Um, so the best we can do is maybe infer from that that if there is a way to measure the value of goods in hours, basically measuring the number of hours put into making it, Perhaps, legitimately, you could trade it through a time bank. Uh, it, it's hard to use this private letter ruling um, as any sort of evidence that time banks will be able to exchange goods without be con being considered barter exchanges, because as I mentioned, it's a private letter ruling. It applies only to that time bank. And uh, it could have just been a fluke that, um, that the IRS wrote it in this way. Uh, but nevertheless, if you just use the same reasoning that I've been talking about throughout, um, about trying to keep time banks and the exchanges out of the market uh, context, then I would say that time banks should allow people to exchange goods. They should definitely tread carefully in how they do so. Um, again, uh, require that it, as much as possible that the goods be made by the actual time bankers, because that's really the, the best and only way to measure how much time goes into making them. Uh, ask people to do uh, as much as possible to break it down and figure out how much time did it take me to make all of these pies divided by how many pies are there and, and really give a time value to each thing and to document it just so that people don't exploit the, the situation. And if people do need to take into account 
purchase materials. So if you bought ingredients and then cook something, you know, maybe you just want to have people reimburse each other for those dollar amounts that they spent rather than somehow trying to wrap the dollar amounts into the time calculation. Because as soon as you start to uh, wrap dollar amounts into the time calculation, it's a slippery slope. And if you say, oh, okay, $20 is worth one hour, then time dollars suddenly are worth $20. Um, and you don't want people to have that kind of dollar um, value in their minds when they're making exchanges. They're going to start calculating the value of everything. So, uh, so those are my suggestions, but the biggest suggestion is to tread carefully. A uh, bigger picture thing that I've noticed is that there are a lot of time banks, barter exchanges, other kinds of platforms being created in the sharing economy that have this gravitational pull toward the commercial realm. They start out with a gift economy, more of a gift economy framework, and over time they evolve their terms or they evolve their practices that it sends them toward the commercial realm and potentially toward the taxable and regulated realm. Um, so I think it's just something to watch and to be really conscious of, do you want to go there and are you ready to comply with the regulations? Okay, I'm going to make a very brief mention of a couple other regulatory areas that barter exchanges especially should probably know about. Maybe also time banks. Um, Bank Secrecy Act is a federal law that's primarily designed to prevent money laundering, but what it basically requires is that money services businesses uh, which includes money transmitters. Uh, money transmitters is really broadly defined, more or less as entities that um, you know, take money from one person and transfer it, transmit it to another. Um, basically, the requirement is that they need to register uh, with uh, fe federal regulators, and they need to collect a lot of information and report suspicious activity, and it's really an administrative hassle. If you're a small community-based barter exchange, it would be an incredible hassle to have to comply with this. And there has been some recent guidance about whether the Bank Secrecy Act applies to virtual currencies, and as I mentioned earlier, barter exchanges in some ways are kind of uh, virtual currencies. Um, in any case, there has been some guidance written by um, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, which tries to parse out, you know, what is a virtual currency and when does the Bank Secrecy Act apply. Uh, I'm going to talk about this in the currency webinar, so I'm only mentioning it briefly here, and I'm also just mentioning it to point out that there are gray areas, and I don't really even think it's possible to navigate them until we change the laws or until FinCEN gives greater more clear guidance. So for now, be aware that if you're a barter exchange, this law might apply to you. Uh, my opinion is that it shouldn't apply to you uh, because it's um, really intended for different types of businesses, but, um, but it might. So know about that and also know that at the state level there are money transmission laws uh, in California, we have the Money Transmission Act, which applies to money services businesses and requires huge fees to register as a money transmitter. We're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. It requires that the money transmitter have a bond of $250,000 to protect con consumers if they lose their money through the money transmission. Uh, so in sum, a small-scale barter exchange could not apply they could not comply with it. But fortunately, the Department of Business Oversight in California recently uh, wrote a letter indicating that barter exchanges are not subject to the Money Transmission Act. So that's good news, but it doesn't answer the question of whether or not money transmission laws apply to barter exchanges in the other 49 states. So this is a major area that the Sustainable Economies Law Center is paying attention to, and we're writing up our thoughts about how we think the laws should be rewritten just, just to make sure that we have space for barter exchanges and time banks and other activities. So uh, with regard to policy, I said I'd mention that just a little bit, we definitely need to address the Bank Secrecy Act and money transmission laws. These are you know, hot topic areas for currencies right now, currencies and barter networks. We, um, we have some other um, laws that we could change that would make barter exchanges a little bit easier, more clear to operate. And one of them is that requirement that a 1099B be issued for every transaction. Uh, Annette Riggs from IRTA pointed out to me that um, one nice thing about 
issuing a 1099B for every transaction is it gives us really rich data and information about what is happening in the realm of the barter economy, which is a good point, um, but it doesn't it doesn't help us with the fact that it really is a huge administrative hassle. Um, the requirement that taxes be paid in dollars is something that I think is really worth revisiting. Of course, a lot of taxes, most taxes will probably always be paid in dollars, but I think for certain individuals who are receiving certain types of income, uh, I think it's a really good idea to allow people to quote unquote pay their taxes through some sort of community service. And then, um, yeah, I guess that is all I will say about policies related to the barter industry and time banks right now. Um, there are a lot of other policies related to currencies that I'll also bring up in the next webinar. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is entity structure and tax exemption for time banks and barter exchanges. First thing I want to say is that if you're forming a nonprofit association or corporation, think of that as the cake. And then think of the tax exemption, like the 501c3, as the icing. The tax exemption is the thing that allows you to not pay taxes, and it's also the thing that allows you, if you're a 501c3, to accept grants and tax-deductible donations. So 501c3 is a great thing to have, but it's not absolutely necessary. So there are really three layers of consideration when you are forming your organization. There are at least three, but these are the big ones. One is what entity are you going to choose? And this is something that you form at the state level, usually by filing paperwork with the state. You know, and you choose from a nonprofit corporation or a cooperative corporation um, and so on. After that, you ask yourself if you do want to get tax exemption, then if so, under what um, tax status? And then after that, you have a lot of decisions to make about your governance structure and how you operate and so on. So if you're going the nonprofit route, there are generally two types of nonprofits that you could form at the state level, and it varies a little bit from state to state. But generally speaking, there's something called the Public Benefit Nonprofit Corporation. And these are the nonprofits that are doing work to benefit the broader public. Uh, there's also mutual benefit nonprofit corporations, which like they sound, are doing work to create a mutual benefit for the members and the participants in those organizations. So they're more inward focused. And these two types, generally speaking, they tend to get different categories of tax exemptions. So the public benefit ones often get exemption under 501c3 or c4. And then there are a whole lot of other types of statuses for organizations that are designed to benefit the members. And if you think about it, time banks and barter exchanges, on one hand, they are there to benefit the members who are participating. And in, in that respect, they are of a very mutual benefit type of character. But at the same time, they exist to create a much better world and to create economic opportunity. Uh, and they're often coupled with activities like educational activities and community building that um, are the types of things for which you would probably get 501c3 or 501c4 tax exemption. So probably most of the time banks out there right now are, they tend to be public benefit nonprofit corporations. What's happening right now is that many of them are struggling to get tax exemption. The IRS is increasingly denying tax exemption under 501c3 especially. Uh, barter exchanges, I've seen all kinds of legal structures for them. I've actually seen that a pretty large number of them are structured as for-profit companies, which um, for me, ideally, I think that all of these entities, because they are designed to provide economic benefits to their members, I honestly believe that they should all be in some way controlled by their members. Um, so having that be owned by a for-profit company uh, is not ideal in my view, but anyways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the tax exemption. 501c3 is the one that people are most familiar with. Uh, not only does it not pay taxes, but the donations are tax deductible, and that's, generally speaking, the status that you need if you're going to get a foundation grant. So to be a 501c3, your purposes have to be limited to those which are charitable, educational, scientific, religious, and there are a few other categories. 
And these things are not as broad as they might sound, and the IRS over time, through their various rulings, have defined what it means, for example, to be charitable. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, generally speaking, 501c3s can't operate something that looks like a regular commercial business. Uh, they can't be operating for the private gain or benefit of any person or group of people. So it's interesting because a lot of what time banks are doing and a lot of what many organizations are doing and what you might call the sharing economy or the new economy, they're trying to benefit us, we the people who are participating in them. So because it's that inward benefit as opposed to the outward broad public benefit, sometimes the IRS is a little bit hesitant to grant the tax exemption because they do look at it more as a mutual benefit activity. Uh, and it also, these projects are very practical. They help us meet our economic needs, and so it becomes hard to justify them as an educational activity, although some time banks and other organizations do say, oh, the primary purpose of this time bank is educational. And I'll talk a little more about that. So the IRS has definitely issued letters and rulings and issued tax exemption um, recognition letters for time banks and they especially do so when they recognize that the time bank is primarily operating to serve a charitable purpose. There's this one particular letter the IRS said, okay, um, as long as these people who are using the service are part of a charitable class of people and as long as the program itself is a charitable activity, um, then this won't jeopardize your 501c3 status. Uh, so a little bit more about what is charitable. Focusing on the relief of the poor, distressed, and underprivileged. This is one of them. There are other categories of what is charitable, such as relieving neighborhood tensions, combating community deterioration, and all of these are things that time banks do, in fact, contribute to. Uh, but specifically, relief of the poor, distressed, and underprivileged, as the IRS calls people, uh, at-risk youth, homeless, seniors, residents of high-crime neighborhoods can all be considered uh, potentially to be part of this class of people, uh, people who are low-income, and it can be hard to define low-income, but in some places the IRS has used uh, twice the poverty level as its uh, definition of low-income. Um, I have often in uh, tax exemption applications emphasize that an organization is serving a lot of people who are unemployed or they are economically distressed. Um, and this is what we did when the Sustainable Economies Law Center was helping the Arroyo Seco Time Bank in the Los Angeles area. Uh, when we were helping them get tax exemption, we used a lot of statistics about the Los Angeles area and about those particular areas in LA and what the rate of unemployment was, and we gave some statistics about the actual members of the time bank and how many of them were unemployed, and, and I think that really helped to point to the fact that this time bank is not just um, there to serve everybody. It was really emphasizing and reaching out to communities of, of particular economic need. Um, we also, in that particular application, and this is on our website, we put it on communitycurrencieslaw.org, we put the actual narrative on there. Arroyo Seco um, engages in all kinds of other activities coupled with a time bank. They do a lot of community building activities uh, like urban farming and they do a lot of educational activities. And that puts the time banks, the time bank in the context of a broader educational and charitable purpose. So I think that time banks, in many, many cases, can make the case that they are deserving a 501c3 tax exemption. I am less convinced that barter networks and local currencies would be able to persuade the IRS of the same thing. And the reason is because of everything I've spoken about so far, which is that probably barter exchanges and local currencies, the participants are operating with more of a market mentality and less of a gift economy mentality. Uh, and that alone kind of, it really shifts 
it can really shift the purpose and the outcomes of the activity. Uh, it still could be worth trying in certain circumstances to, um, to show the ways in which a barter network or a local currency is contributing um, to uh, the relief of the poor, distressed and underprivileged, or um, combating neighborhood de deterioration, but I think it would be actually more difficult. Um, another question is, so you can also get 501c3 status on the basis that your activity is primarily educational, and you could potentially justify a time bank as educational because really time banks are so unfamiliar to people and alternatives, alternative economies are so unfamiliar to people. Doing anything, uh, exchanging with anything other than dollars is going to take practice and time banks in essence become a living classroom, kind of a laboratory for practicing these skills and refining these skills and um, at the same time, I think it, it can be a stretch to say that the sole purpose of a time bank is educational because, I mean, let's get real, they are, we're all, we're doing this to really shift the economy and to provide for people. It's very practical. It's not just educational, it's very practical. So, uh, but it's worth, in a tax exemption application, it's worth emphasizing all of the ways in which the time bank is educational and it's creating new skills and teaching people new ways to interact with each other. So 501c4s are a much easier strategy. They may not be ideal. So if your organization is really hoping to get foundation grants or you're hoping to get donations that people will um, be motivated to give on the basis that it's tax deductible, then 501c4 is going to be hard because you, you, the donations are not tax deductible. But uh, otherwise, it is a tax-exempt organization, so you don't have to worry about paying the taxes on the net income or the... Um, any minimum taxes that your state might have. Examples of things that lately have been getting 501c4 status are farmers markets since um, you know in some ways 501c4s can be a little bit of a catch-all for things that didn't quite fit into 501c3. So for example a farmers market that's not just serving a charitable class but is serving a much broader community than that it probably fits a little better under 501c4. Um, so a local currency in Davis, California, we helped them to get 501c4 recognition. And again, it was because they were not confining the use of a currency to any particular charitable class of people. Uh, but it, we did make the case that it was benefiting the community as a whole, and this is the key to a 501c4. It's a social welfare organization. You want to benefit a broad sector of the community, not a really specific group of people. And so we emphasized all of the ways in which it was improving the local economy and creating economic opportunity and so on. So for the time bank that we worked with to get 501c3 status and the local currency that we worked with to get 501c4 status, we've actually copied and pasted some of the language from the tax exemption application and put it on communitycurrencieslaw.org, uh, which is one of our legal resource libraries. So you can check that out. And um, all of this brings up a question, which is um, to the extent that time banks and local currencies and many of these other activities aren't fitting quite perfectly within existing tax exemption categories, Maybe it's time for a new tax exemption category that's recognizing what people are actually doing. And right now, I think there are 29 categories under the 501c section. And each of them is highly tailored to something very specific. Uh, or it was originally created for things that were very specific, like ditch digging, mutuals, and um, things like that. There are a handful in the upper numbers that could potentially apply to a time bank, but it's a real stretch. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Um, but I guess one question that every group should be asking itself is whether time us or whether um, tax exemption is even necessary, because as I said, 
You can create your cake, but you don't necessarily need the icing of the tax exemption, and especially if your organization is operating at cost, meaning it's not going to have a lot of net income to pay taxes on at the end of the year, and if you live in a state that doesn't have a high minimum tax for corporations, which in California, it's $800 per year if you form a corporation and you're not tax exempt, and that's a pretty heavy burden. But in other states like Oregon, I know that it's much less, and in, in those states, it's a lot easier to have a corporation that doesn't seek tax exemption. I had this idea that I was going to ramble on about governance and about ownership structures and why this is such an important topic for time banks and barter exchanges. I'm not going to ramble on about it because I just remembered that I've done another presentation that I could easily turn into a video, so I'm going to turn it into a video. I'm going to put the link in the notes section on this YouTube page so you can click on that and watch that governance video which I think is going to be about 15 or 20 minutes long but really the key is that time banks and barter networks are created to serve the members that are using it and to um, support them, provide for them and the only way to ensure that an entity is operating to provide for its members is to really put the members in charge and to engage them in the decision making. And engagement is also important for another reason, which is that this is a com many of these platforms thrive on the basis that people are creating communities and building relationships. And their participation in the operation of the entity can really drive that. Um, I generally think that these platforms shouldn't be privately owned because the private owners of, let's say you have a, a barter exchange that's operated by um, a few private individuals who have formed a corporation, um, there's really not an easy way to keep them accountable. Um, there are some laws, like the money transmission laws, that may, may apply to them, but it's not clear. Um, to that are somewhat designed to keep them accountable, but you never know when they might just close down and that really destroys the platform on which people were building their community. And so, so the message that I'll leave you with is just that the members really should control the platforms and be engaged in them. And I'll post that other video in the notes. Uh, so, um, so we're the Sustainable Economies Law Center. There's our website. Uh, CommunityCurrenciesLaw.org is our legal resource library on all of these topics. And if you're watching this prior to July 23rd, 2014, on that day at 11 a.m. Pacific time, we're going to have a chat. And so the chat is designed to answer any questions that you have remaining at the end of this video. Um, and to just discuss ideas, think about potential routes to changing the laws and anything else you want to talk about. And we're going to have some celebrity guests, Linda Hogan and Terry Daniels of Our World. And they have traveled all over the place and are familiar with so many time banks around the U.S. They are familiar with the various struggles, many of the legal barriers that they're hitting, and they just have a lot of real practical on the ground knowledge about how to operate a time bank. So they're gonna join us for the chat, meaning you could ask them questions, you could ask me questions, you could ask questions of my coworkers, Chris Tittle and Yasi Eskandari of the Community Currencies Program, and people can ask each other questions. So stay tuned for that and we hope you'll join us. Okay, thanks so much.